Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, we have one of my personal favorites in the nonprofit sector, Katie Warnick, CEO, and, and really the, and the founder of Staffing Boutique. Staffing Boutique is a really interesting staffing company that just serves the nonprofit and educational sector. And so this is the woman to go to. Katie, I've got to tell this quick story. Um, when Jarrett and I first started, um, you know, chatting in, daily, and we called it the Corona Chronicles because I thought it would just be, you know, a couple weeks. You called me on the phone and said, "Hey, my name's Katie Warnick. Um, I want to, I want to, you know, work with you and talk to you." And we were like, "Oh, okay, yay!" <laughs> because at the time, Katie. It was just Jarrett and I talking. We weren't, we didn't have guests because, we, and then we got you on and we were like, holy moly, this, this is like an amazing thing. So I've been doing all the talking. Let me get through my housekeeping. And then we're going to like completely drill down with Katie about staffing. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd is not going to be with us today, but she'll be back here tomorrow. We want to thank all of our presenting sponsors and Katie was our very first presenting sponsor. So I'm going to give a shout out to Staffing Boutique first and I want to thank Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Be Generous, Your Part-Time Controller, Nonprofit Nerd and Nonprofit Thought Leader. You know, if you have missed any of our more than 700 episodes, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, and Vimeo. And cue us up on your pod, your favorite podcast outlet. We are on so many platforms. And as of this last year, we um, started migrating all of these episodes onto podcast format. So you can take the nonprofit show with you wherever you may go, which is pretty exciting. Katie Warren, CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique. Staffingboutique.org is where you can find her. She and her team are amazing. Sometimes we have one of her uh, uh, compatriots, Dana Skurlock, on. And so that's also another great voice. Katie, thank you for joining us. Oh, you bet. Thanks for having me. Dana is my ride or die. We've been working together for a very long time. I trust her 100% with the business. Mm -hmm. And she's just such a performer that I love when she's on. Yeah, she's really cool. Um, yeah. She's really been fun. She's given us some different perspectives. And um, again, this, I think the staffing issue um, is the centerpiece of our nonprofit sector and I got to say, I think it's even more important than fundraising at this point. I don't know if, I, I mean, I think to me, it's, I don't want to use the word burden, but it's such a, a piece of it. And we are not able to get people to work with us. So let's drill down because I have a lot of questions. And first and foremost, and this is a big topic, but what is the current market? for staffing in 2022? Like, what does it look like? Wow, this year has been amazing. I mean, people are staffing. We've actually been busier than ever as a staffing firm. I think this is our strongest year. I mean, we came on to a strong third and fourth quarter in 2021 mm -hmm. with everything with the reopening, but 2022, I, I, I mean, I don't know the numbers. Um, on a national level for staffing firms, but I know all of my friends that are in the, in the staffing industry that do recruiting for other sectors are having their busiest year ever. Um, again, it's our busiest year. We only service the nonprofit sector and charter schools, which obviously operate as nonprofits. So we're killing it. Um, it was, I would say first, second, and even into third quarter, it was almost too much. You know, we were saying no to business. We were really being strict with who we were working with. Um, we were only working with uh, organizations that were only using us as a staffing firm, mm -hmm. um, not any other recruiters in the area. Um, it's been a really busy year. And I think it's just the, the challenge of finding and retaining good talent is so high uh, coming off of COVID and everything that's kind of just been going on with the economy and, and the world, <laughs> right? Yeah, and then yeah, the, the world. job market that 
the, you know, the need for recruiters has been more important than ever. Um, you know, organizations that always said, I'm not going to use you. I'm a nonprofit. I can't afford a staffing firm. We're kind of knocking at our doors. Um, and one of the things that I've always liked in my business is when I speak to clients that say that to me when, when they do come back to me, you know, and, and I have a really, you know, candid conversation with them and say, you know, you can use me now or you can try on your own and then call me back in three months and you'll be like, you were right. And then they go with me anyway. So it's just, a, it's a, t- am I a time saver? What are we doing here? But to answer your question, we're busy. It's, it's been a strong 20, 2022. Uh, is that how you said it? 2022. And we're looking forward to the next year right around the corner. So let me drill down a little bit, because what I hear you saying, it sounds like you have nonprofits that were like, no, we don't use staffing companies. We do it all ourselves. And it sounds to me like you've had not like you've had new people enter the marketplace who maybe have never used staffing companies. Is that fair to say? That's that's accurate. I mean, that's always been a little bit of a challenge for recruiting firms with the nonprofit sector. You know, um, I don't work with large corporations. Right. So. Right. I worked at places that did recruiting for large corporations. And, you know, it's very easy to make a sales call on the first call when you're new to recruiting and get a company that wants to work with you because they really don't care about every single dollar in their budget. They have an amount for temp workers. A lot of nonprofits, especially smaller ones, don't ever sort of budget in temp workers, number one, and they're very strict with their dollars, obviously, and rightfully so. So a sales call for me blind is never really going to turn into a sale. And I know that it typically doesn't turn into a sale, you know, for, for six to nine months, quite frankly, because we're working on a fiscal year, right? Mm-hmm. So with that being said, yes, new organizations that have said, you know, hard nose to me in the past have reached out. And it's always funny because, you know, I keep a a pretty strong database of just who I've touched base with, spoken to, and, you know, people I have notes on from when I first started my company back in 11, you know, are now calling me, you know, directors of finance or HR that are still at the same organization. We've never had a challenge recruiting, but this year has been been challenging for us, especially the larger, more prestigious organizations in New York City. They have a pretty strong volunteer base as well as job applicant base that they can tap into pretty easily that they wouldn't have to ever use me. Um, and those resources have dried up and they're coming, in to, so <laughs> coming to the you, dark side. <laughs> so what are they looking for? Like what, what are nonprofits saying, you know, we need help in this? I mean, Are there certain segments of the labor market that people are looking for? Or is it just like, we need a warm body to do a lot of different things? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, it's not really warm bodies. Um, We we find that's pretty challenging just always with nonprofits. Um, Small offices, hard, you know, just warm bodies don't really fit into that sort of work environment. what we've seen a trend with in terms of hiring is people that want to be in the office, office managers. So organizations that, you know, a lot of organizations are remote or hybrid or some of them completely closed and just kept like, you know, a we work space or something like that. But there are organizations that actually have a physical space that there needs to be a present presence there. So people that can do a solid schedule that want to be there unfortunately those jobs tend to pay the least so that's that's a big uh, position so you know again operations managers office managers anyone that's vaccinated that will commit to you know a nine to five schedule monday through friday or eight to four or whatever so that's the first um i'd say position that's high in demand we've seen a huge uptick in events jobs um we've always done events you know, staffing. So from anything from an events assistant to a director, um, you know, soup to nut events, whatever. But I would say the past third and fourth quarter, we've had a tremendous amount of events jobs. If I was to speculate why, and and they are temp jobs, is because when COVID happened, they probably laid off their events director. And now they're back in the full, you know, event swing of things. And now they need to hire back attempt to run the logistics of it. Maybe the director of development is handling sort of the bigger picture stuff, the solicitations, the table sales, the logistics, and now they need someone to come in and run it. And maybe they haven't budgeted in that position yet. So while they set up to do that, they're hiring temps. 
Okay, that is fascinating. This is why I love talking to you because I feel like within our sector, you're on the leading edge. You're seeing like what's mm -hmm. gonna come down, you know, the path for us before mm -hmm. a lot of other people do. And I am fascinated by that because um, that really is, an, is a shift in not just saying, okay, yeah, development, you also do events, take it over. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because I was actually having a conversation with a client last night um, specifically about a, an events position that we're recruiting on. Um, it's actually his organization specifically needs uh, a temp and then a permanent person. And again, we've had a number of events jobs come in on both ends of the spectrum. So temp part-time and then full-time firm. And so we've been heavily in the events recruiting, I'd say the past six to nine months. And we're struggling to find the talent within the compensation that is budgeted for that position specifically. So let's just use some numbers here. If we were to recruit for a permanent events manager and the organization has budgeted, let's say 65,000, which probably was a good salary, someone that is working full-time in the same area, making pretty much the same money, isn't incentivized to then move. And so we're in like a situation of the new organization that we're recruiting for is paying maybe, you know, $2,000 more a year than what they're currently making. Is it worth it for that person? No, right? And I don't know, remember, I don't know which episode I was on with you. It probably was earlier in the year. We were talking about um, leveraging maybe I think a job offer yes, and, you know, yes. at the, and you know, I think it was the beginning of 2022. That's what we're in now. Yeah. We were talking about what's the ask when you're asking for your own uh, salary and negotiating and industry standard was a 25% increase of where you're at. So if we look at the, and, and again, we deal with the nonprofit sector. So let's just be flexible. Let's just say 18%. And someone's offering two thousand dollars more. It's just not worth it, you know, to go to a, a new organization that you don't know. You know, you really need to be able to to negotiate that and and be competitive. And that's been an issue. So we're seeing that on small the smaller scale, smaller organizations, and then the very large hospital foundations and performing arts organizations. They're just not budgeting what they want to attract. So we're at a place with our clients where you know it's constant communication and dialogue, but should you lower your expectations and take an events assistant and train up? Because that seems to be the best bet here. And I mean, I can say that across the board with all of the positions that were you're having trouble filling because of salary. Um, but you really need to let go of the expectations of what you want in someone at the budget that you're at. Like those days are gone. Okay. Well, okay. So I just want to reframe that because what I hear you saying is that we are not going to get the caliber. You use something fascinating. You use the, that phrase train up just to like give it over and say, I'm going to have to come in at a lower level, have the resources to train somebody and help navigate them so that they can do a higher level job. I think that that's what we have to do, wow. especially talking about hiring, you know, um, more on the DEI side of things, right? I think we need to be looking bigger spectrum talent. How can we grow our organization up from the ground up? And I think we just look at, you know, need to look at training up just in general. Um, one other thing I did want to touch, touch on is again, we do event staffing all the time. And typically when we do post events jobs, we get a strong number of events, nonprofit people, what we've seen with our job postings on Indeed, on Monster, on Idealist, is we're getting a ton of people from more like corporate events, marketing events, catering events. And they, this would be a different sort of lifestyle for them, more of a, a steadier schedule. Mm -hmm. Those people are very strong with logistics, but they don't have that fundraising piece. <laughs> so I think, and this is the first time I'm seeing this because, you know, two years ago, three years ago, I would have never entertained a resume like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that person's never worked in the nonprofit sector before. Maybe they've done a fundraising event at a restaurant for a nonprofit, but that's a totally different, you know, human, right? Yeah. Now I'm at the point where I'm just like, it might make sense to bring this, this person in. Um, 
or, or trial them at least. Um, so that's something that I'm exploring with one of my, my organizations now, because they can't budget what they want. You know, they don't have the budget for what they want. I'm fascinated by this because what an incredible arc of change and results from when we first started talking with you, Mm -hmm. you know, I remember Katie, it was like, keep your job. Don't let it go because you'll never find another one that, you know, the marketplace is shriveled up and we're seeing layoffs. And now it's just been such a dramatic shift um, to where we're looking at and we're questioning even something, dare I say, integrity or work, you know, ideas. Talk to us about what we should be expecting in terms of change, because I feel, and I'm just speaking for myself, being back out in the community from the for-profit to the nonprofit, there is a different tenor in how people are doing their jobs and, and how they're being responsible for their place in the work environment. What kind of changes are you seeing? I've said this before and it's, you know, it's nothing new. I think that we really have to adjust to the work ethic gap, if you will, that's going on. Um, And again, it's not just the nonprofit sector. It's across the board. I see it all the time. I see it at the gym. I see it with friends in different worlds. You know, no one wants to work. And I say this and I sound abrupt, but it's true. The work ethic, the priority of work is just on a different level. So I don't want to say you need to lower your expectations with your staff, but you certainly need to be more empathetic to what their lifestyle demands now and where do you meet them, right? Whether that's PTO days, working from home, um, benefits, you know, just sort of some sort of flexibility or, um, I, I don't know. I can't, you know, I don't even know how to articulate it. <laughs> I don't know. I want to say lower your expectations of what you think you're going to get in the next five years. Cause we're in a really weird place. Wow. You know, um, so this is like a follow-up question to this. And we were talking in the beginning about, you know, salary and compensation. Do you think there's a, a higher value for things like personal time off or, you know, gym membership or free lunch, or are there things that are more intrinsic to that sense of why somebody wants to work in your nonprofit that maybe goes beyond dollars? Yeah, huge. Always. That's always it. And, and I think that, you know, we really need to look at retention always. I think that that's the first priority. So when you're thinking about what you need to change in your organization, look at retention year end is coming. This is a great time. If you have some sort of HR department in place to do maybe a survey monkey, what your current staff is looking for, because people are going to go. And remember, we're in a time where communication is, is lost. So even if you have, you know, a grant writer or a database person that you think is super duper happy and you have a great um, rapport with them and you think your communication via email is great, if they get approached by another organization to make 18% more, they're out the door. Mm-hmm. So, but they, you know, they don't want to be. And, and again, no one wants to speak up and ask for more money and, and leverage that. And, and of course you want to have that open dialogue. I say it to my staff. I mean, my staff has grown quite a bit over the past 16 months. And that's the first conversation I have when I check in with them. And that's the first conversation I have with them when I hire them. If there is something that you do not like, if there is something that I do wrong, if there is something that you're uncomfortable with, I want you to call me and I want you to tell me and I want this to change. I want to fix any sort of problems that we have going on so that you're comfortable and you're happy here. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean that they're asking for more money. Maybe it's just yeah. responsibilities. Maybe there's a task that they have to do that's so administrative that they don't feel like they should be doing it. Okay, I can have one of our attempts do that. You know, like I can very easily fix anything. I'm the owner of this company, but I need to know. And I'm not going to know unless they don't tell me. So are you having open dialogue with your staff constantly, monthly, quarterly, whatever it is, it's so important. And that's just why retention plan is way more important than a recruitment plan any day. It's that's fascinating. I mean, that that's a fascinating um, thing because in my lifetime, this has never been a conversation. It's always been, you're lucky to have a job and right. 
And so you're privileged to be a part of our team. So that leads me kind of to the next question. You know, is having a job and working in the nonprofit sector still sexy and still something that people want to do? Or because I think that covered a lot of multitude of sins. I think Mm -hmm. people would be like, yeah, I'm not getting the right salary or my benefits are crappy, but I'm working, you know, for mission. Mm -hmm. I'm working with purpose. Are you seeing that change or is that getting stronger? What do you, what are your senses of that? I don't think that it's lost appeal by any means, but I, yeah, I think that there's still those people that want to work in the sector. And they know that, and and they're the same people that know that they want to be, you know, a healer or a nurse or a teacher. You know, you just kind of have in your gut what you want to do and what you definitely don't want to do. So I think that there's always going to be people that want to work in the sector. Um, I do think it needs to be extremely competitive with with how they keep the people in the sector, right? I, that's so. To answer your question, yeah, I do think that the sector is still strong. Yeah, I think that's really an interesting thing. Um, Also, you know, we have 1.8 million nonprofits registered in this country. We forget there's a lot of competition within our own sector, right? I mean, so you're going to get picked off by yet another nonprofit if you're not looking at that retention, which I loved that you brought that up because we don't talk about that enough. Retention plan always. We really don't talk about that enough. It's so interesting. Okay. Now I was chatting with you in the green room and, uh, I was like so proud of myself because I found a girl holding a crystal ball with red hair. (laughs) For those of you listening to the podcast, Katie has this glorious red hair and I actually found an image of somebody (laughs) holding a crystal ball. So this is where I put you on the hot seat. What's your crystal ball forecast? So, yeah, so I think that the sector and hiring is still going to remain strong. It, we're definitely living in a weird time. You know, I listen to all these financial podcasts and we're technically in a recession and, you know, tech is laying off, but, you know, we're still strong. The industry industry is still strong. Um, we're still seeing hiring trends. Uh, employment rate is still very low. So I think that the sector will definitely remain strong into the first and second quarter of 2023. If there is any sort of slowdown or hindrance on nonprofits, it probably won't happen until the next fiscal year. You know, we are typically late, right? So many organizations start their new new budget on July 1, but I think that first and second quarter hiring is going to be strong. Um, There's competition. You know, there's, like you said, there's so many nonprofits. You have to think about all the nonprofits that are competing to get the same talent and how are you going to step up your game? Because that's what this is about at this point. You know, it's really interesting too about how many, it's, it's, it's a big question in our sector. How many people are actually looking at retention? Are they thinking about this? I mean, I bet it, we tend to be so reactionary in the nonprofit sector anyway, to our own detriment. How many of us are actually stepping back and saying, okay, who do we have? What do we have? And what's the work situation? And, and I appreciate you bringing that up because um, that has not been a trajectory that American business for profit or nonprofit has really taken. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, we've, we've been used to saying, don't worry, there's a line of people that we can bring to the door to take these, these jobs. And, and that's, that's not fair. Case. Yeah. And you know, it, even the larger organizations do have, you know, um, the the exit interview but what happens at an exit interview what where is that data going you know is it even looked at or is it just a piece of paper in the file and so you really need to look at that and then um you know the other thing i still think that this this world is just kind of on edge i think everybody is at like an 11 on a one one to 10 scale you know nerves are heightened and you know where it's just constant confrontation and it's constant confrontation via text message or email it's never confrontation anymore via phone and you know knowing that how can you communicate how can you pick up the phone and call someone and have a difficult conversation is just something that we really need to preach and look at you know how many times are you sending an email where it should have been a phone call um, I think that that's huge. I, I just think that's so huge and it's so forgotten. We're so many keyboard warriors out here. And, you know, 
I mean, I think two weeks ago I said three times to someone is, is this a professional thing to send to me via email? When you can call me, you call me. Three people apologized to me 48 hours later. You know, I love that you said that. And I need to take, no, I needed to take that into my heart too, because I think that I have been pissy lately. I'll, I'll mm-hmm. man up to that. And yeah, you send emails and texts with a different tenor than if you have to look at somebody in the eye. And so yeah. I appreciate that you said that. That's really interesting. Wow. Katie Warnick, you are just such a, well, first of all, I, I truly believe this. If I, if I need to know what the trajectory is you're the first call to make because you thanks yeah you see these things coming about that then impact everything and in labor again i really do believe this katie is the central issue of our time right now in the nonprofit sector more Mm -hmm. so than virtually anything else because you know we can talk about technology we can talk about fundraising we can talk about management but if we don't have the talent, we can't do any of that. Exactly. So it, it's such an important conversation to have um, well before you're in crisis. And so, yeah. you know, Katie Warnick, um, CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique, check out staffingboutique.org and you can learn about their work. It's such an interesting piece of the puzzle when you think about them just working in the nonprofit sector on mm-hmm. this labor side. Super cool and always a delight to have Katie. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd herself, will be back with us tomorrow. Again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors, which Staffing Boutique, as I mentioned at the front of the show, was our very first one. So yay, <laughs> team. We have joined um, hands with nonprofit thought leader, Nonprofit Nerd, Your Part-Time Controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Bloomerang, and American Nonprofit Academy. Um, Really a a cool, cool episode. One question just came in, and so I'm going to put you back in the hot seat, Katie. So somebody writes in, has burnout in the nonprofit sector affected how recruiting operates? I have burnt out from the sector because of massive overwork toxic bosses, inadequate salary, and inflexibility in work hours. Yes, it's happening everywhere though. It's not specific to the nonprofit sector. Everyone is sort of at that burnout level, you know, and and you need to do what's best for you. Is it something that it's worth communicating to your boss and trying to fix the problem or are you already out the door? And so what are you going to do about it? Are you going to resign and then look for another job? Or are you just going to actively look for another job? You know, it's really, it's really up to you. And if you're a value to the organization and you're smart with how you communicate, you can probably leverage it to put yourself at ease, to put yourself in a better position. Those are words to live by. Thank you, Katie Warnick. This has been great. Um, I'm going to witness to you this morning before I came on air, my sister, my saintly sister, who is just an angel on this planet, quit her job this morning because she just had too much. And she is a woman that works in a really hard, hard sector um, and uh, did exactly what you just said. She just got to the point where she couldn't take it anymore. And so, yeah, this is happening. So thank you, Katie Warnick. A staffing boutique. You are a rock star. Happy holidays, my friend. Absolutely. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Enjoy whatever you're celebrating. Have a healthy 2023. Absolutely. (laughs) We need to be doing that. All right, everybody. As we like to end every episode, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, our sponsors, and our guests to stay well so you can do well. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Thank you.